effort. We've come to your your poems now. Um, tell me, but before we go into your poems uh, or your poem, what how, what was your entrance into the Black Arts Movement? Because I, I believe from reading you about you, you were definitely there with Dudley Randall and his work and other that were major forces in the Black Arts Movement in the 70s, 70s and 80s. I came by, I guess, gradually and naturally because I went to the predominantly Black college that had graduated Melvin Tolson, Langston Hughes, Larry Neal, who I met when I was an undergraduate. Larry Neal was ahead of me. He had graduated and gone to the University of Pennsylvania. And as you know, Larry is the co-author of the best uh, essay written about the Black Arts Movement that appeared in the Sunday New York Times in 1970, the Black Arts Movement. And uh, I was powerfully impacted by that, but we had been doing some of the Philadelphia poets who had graduated from Lincoln University were in contact with poets in New York. And I have to add the name of Gil Scott Heron because he comes later as a student. He doesn't graduate, but he is there as a student when I'm working at Lincoln years later, three years later. And uh, he comes, goes along to become the most famous of all of us, uh, except for Langston, who I met incidentally at Lincoln and who went over some of my poetry. So I was, I was immersed in a tradition of black poetry um, and reading the elders, uh, but uh, who in their own ways were very Afrocentric, but also reading a young guy by the name of Everett Leroy Jones, uh, who would later become Imamu Amiri Baraka, uh, because it was, uh, there were a few people, uh, Sam Cornish, uh, Norman Pritchard, the Umber writers, et cetera, uh, and Leroy Jones who were being published. Not that many were being published. And uh, it was very rare to find a book of poetry by a black male. There were very few and far between. And, uh, but uh, things were happening. Uh, in my generation, people were listening to Dr. King and listening to Malcolm and more and more to Malcolm. And uh, the consciousness becomes not colored, not Negro, but black we get very comfortable with that word and begin to write consciously and intentionally as black authors by the second half of the 60s. And uh, so a cousin of Devorah's, I think probably Clarence Major reaches out and uh, includes a poem of mine, calls me to send him out, submit a poem for an anthology he's doing in 1968 or 69 titled The New Black poetry. And um, uh, he takes one of my poems. I missed getting into Black Fire because of procrastination. A man by the name of Wilmer Lucas was our connection. I'm talking about Ron Wellburn, Fred Bryant, myself, poets from Lincoln who lived in Philly. Uh, I came to Philadelphia and one of his visits, he said, look, uh, uh, Baraka and Larry Neal are doing this anthology and uh, Larry's authorized me to gather work from you guys for consideration for, uh, publication in the anthology. So he gave us the deadline and I just, I didn't, I wasn't responsible to my own advancement and I just did not, I let it go and I, you know, other things were more important and I had a job that was demanding and uh, I missed the deadline. And uh, I have regretted that for all, all my life, but uh, because uh, people I admire and love uh, are in that and thoughts like Askia, Askia Torre, who was still not as, he wasn't Askia Torre yet when Black Fire came out. His, his birth name is used as, uh, as his author identification. But um, it was Larry Neal's when I was, I was an assistant to the director of the Black Study Center in the Claremont Colleges in California. And I was instructor in Afro-American poetry at my first love. And uh, as of 1969, I was contributing to what was being called the Black Arts Movement early along because Dudley Randall reached out and published 
a collection of Afrocentric love poems that were very political that were in a larger manuscript of mine, a book length manuscript titled uh, Noma. Uh, and all the poems are about loving one another. And uh, as because it was about, you know, at the time, kill Whitey off the pig. You know, we didn't get from can to can and from generation to generation by being hateful. We got there by being loving. And so uh, he liked the poems a lot and he snatched them and published the Broadside Press chapbook of uh, some of those poems. And uh, we'd love to hear you, your, your poem today. We'd love to hear you read it. Okay. And Devorah's going to tease me about running my mouth so much. <laughs> <laughs> he just dawned on me what I did. All right, here's a short version of a big BAM theory of creation. It's dedicated to the most outstanding spoken word poet, Eric Andre, uh, who lives in New Bedford, a former student of mine. I'm going to skip some sections, but first I do have to use these quotes from Oloda Equiano. He says, we are almost a nation of dancers, musicians, and poets. And then from our beloved friend, Maya Angelou, uh, we survive in exact relationship to the dedication of our poets, include preachers, musicians, and blues singers as poets. What makes poetry black with a capital B? It's no mystery. Subject matter, mode, attitude, you know our ways. We are as likely to ritually recite as write. And when we do pen a poem about a who or what or where or why or a when, it often sounds like speech too. And that tends to be true, whether it's about God, politics, love, family, the struggle, or just being blue. Or when mining a mother load of dozens with or for brothers or sisters, or when just improvising with cousins, something we're not likely to do with privileged others. Down home and up the way by way of forced illiteracy, back then when we weren't free by word of law and deed enslaved, accordingly chained by slave trade invested John Locke's rights of the white man and white lies like the declaration of the founding father of Sally Hemings slave children. And then again, when we were Jim Crow beyond that bill of goods titled the Bill of Rights, which made it all good for white males to oppress all they called others, even white females sisters, brothers, far back in the day when we weren't what we are, when some of us weren't even free to name our children ourselves, even then to some degree, we were free to be ourselves. Indeed, even when it was illegal for us in the USA to be able to read, back when standard mainstream American inhumanity had it so that we had no human rights during all those white sheeted nights and daz dazing hellhound days of so-called coon hunts, ritual gang rapes of white gloved black girls on their way to Sunday school, lynchings, Mason Dixon jarred close cropped trophies of black and blue manhood with capital B's. The 19th and 20th centuries, mainstream American KKK terrorism, back when all we had was having to make do and do without to get through. We, the people, we the people steeped in deep river, risen from middle passage and forced drownings in the mainstream deepest bloody old man river, daunting as Cape Fear River, chilly and wide as the river Jordan of ancestral song. We who were done dirty, done wrong, we're not, are not bound by standard mainstream English rules in our oratory, not even in our written poetry. We have broken free of imposed forms from the outrages of being bound in formal and informal cages. Sympathy's caged, broken wing song flies more freely now than even birds, birds bop. They broke bad with breakdancing and hip hop all over spoken word poetry's perches and beyond the lovely dark and deep paper woods and pulp trees, some think they shall never see as lovely as free people's poetry, free to be whatever it wants to be, what it is and is becoming. 
and what we have been through entitles us to tell it like it is of thee and say, it bees that way, that is what we want. What makes a poem black? History. It ain't no mystery. Ancestry, legacy, politics, class, culture, style. Confluence of the mass makes things that come to mind out of a consciousness of kind. Mixed in out of mouth things like ring shouts, refrains, signifying jive, blues, jazz songs, scat, the dozens, R&B, break beats, rap, all that black mouth evolved north, east, west, first hybrid down south of what we used to say is where it's at. Free poetry, free of the slave ship's chokehold, free of the slave breakers silencing iron bit, freed from verse cages of poesy, free to be what comes out of its own history, be it pen declaration or improvised oration as affirmation of its own nation within a nation, recite it or write it or hear it or read it like holy writ because it is, so be it. Thank you. Beautiful. And, and, and your reading, I have to give it to both of you. Uh, you're excellent at what you do. You bring poetry alive. What you've written on the paper, uh, on the page is beautiful, but when it's spoken, it, it really brings, it's like theater. There's a sense of theater Thank in the you. reading of it. That's and black. Really that's very, very yeah. ethnic. And that's, uh, the, that's an Africanism, you know? Kim, can I, can I say, Go ahead. I, I, I love that poem for a number of reasons. One of the things that I, I, what I like about Everett's poetry as a poetic is there's this, both the history, the knowledge of the history and always music in the present. And he has a way of taking words, and I guess it's from a level of literacy where they don't mean one thing, they do double, sometimes triple duty, the same word, just the way he turns it on the phrase so you can read the line this way, or you can also read it that way. And uh, that particular poem, if one is, you know, I'm not something I actually enjoy doing, but if you're going to really parse the poem down and do it like that, you've got all the rhymes, the internal rhymes, the external rhymes, the line breaks, you could really analyze it as a just a, a real solid poem structurally. But it's a poem that the people can grab onto and kind of, yeah. and yes, kind yes. of work with at the same time. And I think that that's the, the, beauty of it because a lot of times people will throw out poems that they say the right thing but they don't have the craft right. or they have the craft but they become uh, a little bit too cultured a little bit too self consciously erudite and yeah 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 exactly and I think but when you're a professor and a poet you use every opportunity and everything as a teaching moment but you're always mindful of that history and so many of the young people don't have it, but if they can engage it or get it that way, I mean, it even rhymes. It's intentionally, you know, most of my poetry does not rhyme, yeah. uh, but that's because it, it, I wanted it's intentional. I wanted to be accessible and I wanted to be remembered and easily recited or sections of it, you know. It, it, and that happens, as particularly the way you use the word black in the mm. poem. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it, 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 it comes out. So if I were a young rapper or a person who was interested in that type of thing, I would probably go down the street rapping your poem. That's nice it, to hear because oh, that's so, what I, that's what I had hoped for. Also free, free. And because it's free poetry, poetry that is free yeah. and the need to free poetry. Right. From the doll, you know, that's what I mean by that kind of going back right. and forth. And from it, Eurocentricity. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it that's what we're trying to do is to become free so it is how do you punch up those things and that's right. what, you know what it's, I think it's like doing. your city values your city values basically are a manifestation of the one word that was most indicative of what the goals of the black arts movement were and that one word was used politically historically and artistically as a criterion uh, throughout the late 60s and the early 70s, that word is relevant. 
relevant yeah, to the yeah. liberation of black people, relevant to the well-being of black people. And if yeah. that is, you know, if you were doing that, then you were consistent with basic tenets of the black arts movement. That's if so you, true. I, I hate to say it, but we've really run out of time. And because I could talk to you both for hours because of the there, there is a naturalism to your writing for both of you. Whether, Devorah, you're talking about the stars or our, our place in the universe, or ever, whether you're talking about icons within our history, like Sonia Sanchez, there's always a feeling of groundedness. There's Thank always you. a feeling that there is a place in the universe where this poetry has come. And it's a place of, of almost of worship. So I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk to you both. And thank you very, very much. Thank I appreciate you. the opportunity to have your cheering faces on such a dreary day here and New England. <laughs> got fog, rain, all kinds of stuff going. Yeah, it's good to see you all. Look at you when you smile, you all light up that screen. It's wonderful. Because well, we're talking to each other. And that exactly. Makes yeah. That makes a difference. Yeah. Well, Goodbye for now, and thank you all for listening.